Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. African swine fever is having a major impact on the hog industry in China and other parts of Asia. Now there's concern the virus could spread to the U.S. SUNUP's Curtis Hare takes a look at how the state of Oklahoma is preparing. In August 2018, the first cases of African swine fever were detected in China. It spread and devastated the pig population. Now there is concern that the highly infectious virus will make its way to the U.S. So the virus is spread through all bodily fluids, um, but the primary spread that we're seeing right now is what we call a sandwich effect. Um, so the virus actually stays viable within um, processed meats and cured meats. African swine fever is not a human health concern. It is not a food safety concern. Dr. Alicia Gorsica Sutherland is a staff veterinarian with the Oklahoma Department of Agricultural Food and Forestry. She says this form of viral movement is why Asian countries have been hit so hard and why the level of concern is so high here in the U.S. So there are different um, virulent strains, but it ranges from what we call high morbidity, high mortality, so um, very acute deaths, um, everything in the barn dies, to one or two uh, within a herd start to become ill and then it just kind of slowly starts to spread. Um, that's the virus strain that we're the most concerned of because it could potentially be missed at first because it looks and mimics like any type of endemic disease. As soon as we were notified that uh, African swine fever was spreading in China, not just Oklahoma, but, but other states, USDA uh, began to get concerned and, and we all started ramping up our, our plans. So we started in November last year with a four state meeting, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas and Colorado and the state vets and the USDA vets. Roy Lee Lindsay is executive director of the Oklahoma Port Council. He says illnesses are always a concern, but African swine fever is different. It was apparent that we needed to make sure we were doing preparedness for ASF specifically. Uh, we were one of the first states to have that kind of sit down, certainly one of the first to have that across state lines reach to other state veterinarians. In September is we had a four day long, what we call a functional exercise, and each day addressed a different um, response action. We talked about um, conducting a foreign animal disease investigation. So that was with us sending out our uh, foreign animal disease diagnosticians out to a producer, collecting samples, getting those to the, to the uh, laboratory in Stillwater, but also to the federal laboratory uh, in New York. Finding ways to stop pork movement, depopulation and disposal, and finally, permitting and securing the pork supply. We move pigs across state lines all the time. It was imperative that our state veterinarian, the state vet in Kansas, the state vet in Texas, uh, work together so that we have the similar kind of response to any disease outbreak. Animals can shed the virus in many different ways, and pigs can pick it up in garbage containing infected pork products. A key component of the preparedness plan is making sure a problem that already exists in Oklahoma doesn't get worse. But if it were to get into a uh, show pig producer in southeastern Oklahoma, say, where there are a lot of feral swine, uh, then I, I don't know how we would ever get rid of it. Uh, it's why we talk often about one of the biosecurity requirements we talk about is how do you protect your herd from feral pigs? What kind of fencing? What kind of separation? What do you have that keeps feral hogs away from your population? Although scary, Oklahoma Secretary of Agriculture Blaine Arthur says the state is ready if an outbreak happens. We are as prepared as we know how to be working with our federal partners, state partners, and industry. In an emergency type situation or any type of animal health outbreak, there are things that we can't anticipate. Which is why communication is necessary. You know, we're not going to have the first case of African swine fever here at the Ag Building. It's going to be on a farm somewhere out in Oklahoma. And in 21 years, I think this has been the most dominant issue, uh, what I've spent working on, and, and I think that speaks volumes to how seriously we're taking uh, this threat. In Oklahoma County, I'm Curtis Hare.
want to talk now about the economic impact of African swine fever with Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. Daryl, let's dive right in and talk about some of the impacts in China and other countries. Well, of course, China is by far the biggest pork producing, hog producing country in the world. Historically, they've produced nearly half of the world's hogs there. So, uh, and it's in, you know, African swine fever is now impacting a number of countries, including some in Europe, uh, some in Africa, uh, but most particularly in Asia. So since this disease was reported in China in August of 2018, it has continued to spread, causing widespread devastation. It's now in North and South Korea as well. Vietnam has been heavily impacted, uh, and the Philippines, Mongolia, uh, and so on. But in China, because of the size of their pork industry, and of course the estimates vary widely and they're continuing to grow because it's by no means controlled there. Uh, so estimates range from 50 to 70 or 80 percent of their hogs may be lost by the end of this year. That's an enormous loss of meat production, not only in China, but really on a global scale. And so because of this deficit of pork production, pork is the most popular meat in China. So there's a huge deficit to be filled there. As, and so. Uh, you know, they're looking to recover that um, wherever they can. They're buying pork, but they're also buying other proteins as well from all over the world. And the fact of the matter is there's a deficit that cannot be filled in the world right now. And what does all this mean for producers and investors here at home? Well, you know, with respect to the pork industry specifically, of course, we have other issues, right, with China right now. So we've got all these trade issues, the tariffs are in place. So the U.S. is probably the least competitive place right now. But again, China really has no option but to try to source protein wherever they can. So we're beginning to see, uh, the pork industry is beginning to see some of the anticipated increase in exports to China. And we'll see more as we finish out 2019 and go into 2020 some fairly direct impacts in the pork industry. Uh, and, you know, again, we're, we're sort of looking for those things to continue to grow as time goes on, despite the tariff situation. And then in terms of how this may translate to U.S. Um, beef markets and kind of that area, interpret that all for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, the beef industry has been an interesting situation. Of course, China has been growing rapidly for a number of years. Uh, they have far eclipsed now the U.S. as the number one beef importing country in the world. Even though beef consumption is per capita is pretty low in China, but in total it's a big number and it's growing very rapidly. And this is going to exaggerate that even more because of the overall need for protein in China. Beef, uh, the U.S. industry has not been very directly impacted by all of this yet because we simply don't export much beef to China. Uh, we don't have much market share there. The tariffs make that an even bigger challenge. Um, but again, the, uh, the, the, the African swine fever situation is going to directly or indirectly boost all markets. So the conversations and opportunities may continue. Absolutely. Okay, Daryl, thanks a lot. We'll you see bet. you again soon. Those Oklahoma producers that uh, have fall calving herds are only uh, a month, maybe just three weeks away from the start of the fall breeding season. So now's a good time to make sure that the bulls that we're going to use in that breeding season are, are ready to go. First of all, if we're going to have what I call a multi-sire pasture, where we're gonna have more than one bull in the breeding pasture at the same time, we wanna have those bulls all ready together in a trap so that they can get the social order figured out. Bulls are going to fight and figure out which one is the dominant male and might as well get that done ahead of time. We don't want that fighting taking place in that first week or so of the breeding season when we'd like to get a majority of the cows actually bred. Second of all, if we're going to use both young bulls and old bulls in multi-sire situations, as much as possible. I'd recommend that we keep them in age groups going into the breeding season together. In other words, mature bulls together and young bulls together. That older, bigger bull becomes more dominant, may actually cause some injury to the younger bull, and we end up a situation where we don't have as much bull power in the breeding pasture as we first expected. If we're going to try to do that, I would really uh, suggest that we put the mature bulls in the first part of the breeding season and then bring the young bulls, the yearling bulls, in to the last, say, one-third of the breeding season. 
That way, they've actually, the younger bulls have got another one to two months of age. They're more mature, and they've got fewer cows to actually inseminate and get bred. Finally, this is the time to go ahead and visit with your local large animal veterinarian and schedule breeding soundness exams for the bulls that you're going to use. That way, you have a sound breeder going into the breeding season rather than finding out next uh, spring if you do the preg checking then or worse yet next fall when you have uh, very few cows that actually uh, have calves due to the fact that you had an infertile bull in the breeding season. Schedule that with your local large animal veterinarian now so that you can get that testing done. While you're visiting with your veterinarian and doing the testing with those bulls, I suggest also that you visit with him or her about the need to have the bulls tested for trichomoniasis. That's a reproductive disease of cattle that uh, we can do a good job of eliminating from our herd if we'll properly test them, especially bulls. So visit with a veterinarian about that particular problem. Now's the time to get those bulls ready for this upcoming breeding season. And I think you'll be glad when you do the preg checking next spring. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. We're out here at the Tipton Research Center with our extension cotton specialist, Seth Bird. And Seth, uh, we got kind of a early season frost in the first part of October. How did that impact the cotton crop? Yeah, so a lot of the cotton that was most impacted by that crop was some of the stuff that was a little behind. We've talked all year about how that early, you know, that early rain we had in the spring, kind of delayed planting has put us behind all year. So for the better part of our crop, it probably wasn't as impactful. A lot of that had already seen a harvest aid application, uh, but for some of the crop that we were hoping to get to that point uh, where the earlier planting crop was, that really better yield potential, uh, it kind of cut that season short. So it certainly made harvest aid decisions from that point moving forward a challenge. Like I said, the crop that saw applications before the freeze looks great. Since then, it's been uh, a little more touch and go with what we can do to get the crop ready to harvest. And one of the problems with that freeze was is that it was pretty unexpected, right? Yeah, so a lot of times when we see a freeze in the forecast, we can make some applications that are maybe earlier than we would normally make them, but it can help us get some of that crop progressed and leafed off and balls open before the freeze happens. Uh, the big issue with that is up until even that day, uh, a large portion of our acres didn't have a freeze in the forecast. And so that was a kind of a surprise freeze and it, it you know, caught a lot of people off guard. Uh, so we weren't able to do some things that we would normally want to do uh, with a freeze in the forecast. What are, what are some of the things that that, you know, that that really cold weather, how does that actually impact the crop, like with the bowl and everything? Yeah, so I mean, the two big things you see is, is effects on the bowl and effects on the leaf. So with, with the bowls that get frost damaged, um, they'll turn kind of a browner color, like a pale brown, or and it's more of an even color. Uh, those bowls e either won't open if they aren't very far along, or you will see some fiber quality issues. So either some brown stain to the lint. And then with the leaves, um, we noticed a lot of uh, um, upper third, upper half of the plants, the leaves that were left were frozen. So they had frost damage, which basically means that our harvest day chemicals really won't work that well on those leaves. So it's really hard to remove them. Uh, so you kind of hope that if they're completely dried down and desiccated, you get some wind to knock them off. But besides like a physical, you know, actual thing to knock the leaves off, you can't get any, you know, good leaf drop from what we'd normally like to see with our harvest aid products. So going forward for that late planted cotton for a lot of those cotton producers, the, you know, the, the outlook for the weather, it's going to start getting even a little bit more colder. So what are, is it, is there still time for some of those harvest aids that producers can put out? or is it a little too late? What should they do going forward? Uh, I think most of our crop at this point has probably either seen an application or just won't see one at all. And they're gonna wait for the, for the next freeze. So another one of the problems that we're having with the weather is like today where we see overcast skies higher than we'd like to see humidity. So today we're like in the mid seventies for humidity. Ideally for cotton harvest, we'd like to see the humidity a little bit lower, particularly if you're uh, using a stripper harvester. Um, so we just have problems with moisture in the lint. Overcast skies I mean that lint's not gonna really dry out in time. Uh, and so we kind of lose days, even when, you know, we could get in the field, it's not raining, but the, the conditions with the clouds, the overcast skies and the humidity are, are also uh, not real conducive to being a good, efficient, clean harvest. All right, thanks, Seth. Seth Bird, Extension Cotton Specialist here at Oklahoma State University.
Hi, Wes Lee with the weekly Mesonet weather report. Cold winter-like precipitation was present this week, improving soil moisture deficits in some areas and adding to marsh-like conditions in others. The seven-day rainfall map from Wednesday shows all areas got something, albeit some in the northwest got it in a frozen format. Rainfall amounts peaked in the southeast with McAllister almost reaching the 10-inch mark. The dry southwest and panhandle were mostly left out. The seven-day change in the 10-inch fractional water map shows the nice green areas of improvement in the south-central areas, while the southwest got a little worse. Soils in the eastern third of the state showed no change because they couldn't get any wetter than they already were. The cold temperatures have been record-breaking this week as well. Highs on Wednesday struggled to get out of the 30s in all but the far southeast. If you look at the previous record lowest daily highs for that date, you see many sites establish new low highs for the day. Some of these records, such as Kingfisher and Stillwater, had held up since before statehood. It looks like we have at least one more week of below average temperatures to endure before returning to normal conditions according to the National Weather Service. Gary is up next showing how the recent range have improved the drought map slightly. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well Mother Nature certainly supplied winter a little bit early this year. Normally we'd expect this type of weather later in November or even into December. But it did show up early and Mother Nature's going to do what she wants to do. So we'll just have to deal with it. Now we did see some improvements in the drought monitor this week. Normally we wouldn't see this great of an improvement, but with the much colder weather, uh, the little bit of precipitation that we did get in the southwestern parts of the state did allow us to maybe ramp up those, those improvements just a little bit. So without uh, further ado, let's get straight to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. Now out across the panhandle, we still remain with the uh, mix of abnormally dry conditions and moderate to severe drought. We didn't see that much of an increase this week, mainly because of the cooler weather again moving in, so we decreased the evaporative demands. Now across southwest Oklahoma, into central Oklahoma, we saw a big reduction in mainly the abnormally dry conditions, just a small amount of improvement in the uh, moderate drought category. And across southeast Oklahoma, we saw a near removal of all uh, drought conditions and also abnormally dry conditions, so just a little bit remaining down in that area. And we see across the, uh, the southeastern corner of the state up into northeast Oklahoma, uh, huge rainfalls. The top, of course, is 15.4 inches up in the Adair County area. And then we see the lack of rainfall out across southwest Oklahoma. Now that departure from normal rainfall for the month of October, we have uh, from one to two inches down in the far southwest, and then around an inch out in the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, across eastern Oklahoma, from five, six, seven to as many as 11 inches above normal. Those areas where it's uh, 100 to more than 300 percent of normal rainfall for the month of October across the eastern half of the state. So the arrival of winter a little bit early did help the drought picture. It has its other problems, of course, but for right now, we'll just continue to watch the precipitation patterns and keep track of that drought as it goes forward. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Managing profit margins to stay in the game. That's the goal of farming any time, but especially after years of disappointing wheat prices. SunUp's Dave Deacon is in Noble County to talk to a farmer who is going back to the basics of raising wheat. The shaft I was talking about, you can see from the tractor cab, you can see the seed cups and you got shaft runs all the way across and you can see that turning from the tractor cab and when you see that turning, you know you're putting seed out. You don't have to worry about any, some electrical wire coming loose causing it to not work. Or... Cody is farming the same land his family has for generations. He, his brother, and father grow wheat, and all together they run about 3,000 acres across Noble County. Just like many other wheat producers, Cody says it seems like it costs a little more to produce a crop that is a little harder to market. Yeah, yeah, the bad things, we've had about three years in a row that weren't very good. There's been a good spots here and there, but overall it's been pretty tough. Between the markets and the weather and, and all the variables we can't really control. When Cody was planning out the 2020 wheat crop, he decided to try something a little less flashy. This year, instead of putting a whole bunch of money into that air drill, I pulled these drills out, which were my grandfather's. Uh, they were bought back in the early 90s, and it was a whole lot cheaper to fix them up. 
And uh, the one thing we can control out here is our cost of our equipment. And technology's nice and sure is fun to run, but it doesn't make the payments. We don't get any more for our grain, whether we use $400,000 worth of equipment or $40,000 worth of equipment to farm it. The elevator doesn't give us any extra. So I'm trying to control the cost of my inputs, at least with the equipment that I'm using. Earlier this year, Cody came across an old Gleaner L2 at a farm auction. And back in their day, these were quite a combine in their day. And he bought it. One little bobtail load of wheat will pay for that combine. I've got a John Deere combine, an older one, but the cost of repairs on it are so high when something does break down that I'm going back to something that's cheaper to maintain and, and uh, leave the John Deere sit in the barn that costs more to maintain. So I'm just trying to cut down where I can to uh, in these tough commodity times. You don't need fancy technology to farm for cattle and, and still harvest some crop, but you know that was what founded this this area and that's what made all the old timers, that's what made them what they were. And, and so if we can cut down our costs, then that gives us more margin for maybe when things get better, we'll have, we can expand back into better technology, but at least we'll still be in business when that time comes, hopefully. <laughs> So John, where have we seen the technology growth over the past, say, 30 years or so? Well, we've seen growth in pretty much every sector of, of ag machinery. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in recent years in kind of electronics, incorporating electronics and machinery. Some of that has due to trying to increase you know, our capacity and, and the things we do and increasing our precision. Uh, but some of those things are you know, kind of regulatory because of emission requirements by engines and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so to go back, as you're saying in technology, you're going to have to go back in year models and, and, and production years, which means you're kind of limited in what's out there because they're not making any more of a particular model that was produced in the 90s or 70s or whatever. And so because of that, you, you've got to consider the, the kind of experience of that particular machine and, and uh, what it's been through, has it been rebuilt, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. It, it is kind of nice to be in a in a, in a cab and be able to have all the monitors of, of, of your quality that's that's going through the combine. Exactly, I mean, those things are, are really nice to have, even if you're not necessarily directly using them to you know, influence your planting or, or other parameters on your, your operation. But uh, you know, if we look at just some of the basic things like uh, you know, guidance systems, um, uh, auto steer systems on, on larger operations, you know, a lot of those things really aren't there for, uh, you know, trying to necessarily improve your yields or uh, maybe even they, they're going to a certain extent be able to kind of improve your efficiency and sometimes, but really it kind of boils down to kind of driver, you know, fatigue. If you look at a, a tractor like the one we've got behind us here that's a little bit newer model, if you look at the cab of that one and we go to a cab of, of one that's 20, 30 years older, right. you know, the visibility to be able to see things around you as you're kind of going through the field, if you're planting, uh, you know, the, just the actual interior of the, the cab as far as the seat, environmental controls, air conditioning, right. heat, that kind of things, you know, you can last a whole lot longer in the day with something like that than you can with the older equipment. That driver fatigue really kind of wears on your body over time. Okay. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Dr. John Long, Ag Engineer here at Oklahoma State University. Kim, as we just saw, producers really have to weigh all their options for what they need on their operation. Yeah, but what works for one farmer probably won't work for another. So each farm is an individual unit. I've talked to uh, producers over the last week that uh, some say that, yes, that's good. You got to keep costs low. If you can do your own repair, if you can use old equipment, if you depends on the size and the amount of management you're willing to put into it. Because if you run older equipment, it's going to take a higher degree of management and you're going to have more breakdown. On the other side, I've had producers say those GP units, they, they're going to more than pay for themselves with their precision. You're not going over the land twice and you're covering it all and that, and that precision is important. So it just depends on the situation, just depends on the farm, the requirements and the manager. Let's dive into some of this week's news and now, starting with the world markets. What's the latest? Well, if you look at uh, world wheat market, uh, production is projected to be 28.1 billion. That's just a slight record over the last year's 28 billion bushels. 
We may or may not make that. Uh, you, your Australia crop, they continue to lower that. They continue to lower the uh, Argentine crop just a little bit. You know, they had a record. It's not a record now. Russia, uh, they're about 98% harvested. We still don't have a good handle on, on the size of their crop. And of course, they've been increasing France's crop. So a lot going on there, but we've got a lot of wheat in this world. Well, let's talk about U.S. Uh, wheat exports and kind of comparisons to last year. Well, exports have been going relatively well. You look at uh, U.S. wheat export sales, they're 11% for all wheat above last year, but our, our outstanding sales, that's that wheat that's in storage, it hadn't been shipped yet, it's 14% below last year. Hard red winter wheat sales, 43% above last year. That's really good. We've already shipped it all, or the majority of it, uh, we're 15% below last year's wheat in storage to be shipped. Uh, soft red winter wheat, 17% uh, sales above last year, 2% uh, below last year, but all exports are below the five-year average. Let's talk about Russia now. Any changes in their exports? Yeah, there's quite a bit going on in Russia. Their exports are projected to be lower this year, but there's, there's some, I've noticed some changes in the market in the pricing system. Uh, this last week uh, on export sales to uh, Egypt, Russia was cut out by, they were underbid by Ukraine, by France, and by Romania. So they didn't get any sell into to, uh, Egypt. And what we're seeing is Russian wheat producers are, they built storage and they're starting to, to store their crop. Uh, last year or in past years, they've had debt, they've had, uh, they needed that cash flow out. They've uh, lowered their debt, they've got the storage, and now they're storing wheat for later in the year. And I think that's going to change our price patterns. Well, with that in mind, do those Black Sea exporters then still com control the prices? Yeah, I think they still have the major influence. Uh, this last sale that Russia, they were actually overpriced for it. But Ukraine, they're, they're harvesting a record crop. They're going to export more wheat than they did last year. Ukraine cut in, came in and set that price along with France. So with that in mind, will the world need Oklahoma's 2020 wheat? I think they will because uh, we've got an excess of wheat, but we don't have an excess. I think we really have a slight shortage of milling quality wheat. And, and when we come into 2020, I believe the world's going to need our wheat as long as we got 60 pound test weight and 12 and percent protein. And where have you heard that before? Of course, right here. All right. As always, Kim, thanks a lot. And that will do it for us this week. We will see you next time at SUNUP.